Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Warren from BIA. Welcome to our weekly COVID-19 update webinar. This week, we're focusing on the impact on commercial research. Uh, delighted to welcome, as usual, our Chief Executive, Steve Bates. Morning, Steve. Morning, Michael. Good stuff. Okay, so, I mean, lots in the news this week, which, Steve, we will go through in our usual fashion in a second. But, I mean, the major focus of today's webinar is that commercial research impact. So, uh, I suppose the questions we're asking ourselves today, Steve, are what's the current position in terms of the trials landscape in the UK, in the EU, and globally? What have we seen change in terms of the regulatory system adapt over the last few weeks as people have uh, come to terms with what COVID means? And then most critically, I suppose, and most interestingly, what might this mean for the future of clinical research? And we've got some fantastic guests lined up uh, to speak to this topic today. So we've got Divya Chadamanek, who's director of NIHR, uh, who give us an understanding of what NIHR have done in terms of adjusting and prioritizing COVID-19. And we've got Fiona Maney from Metadata, uh, one of the really excellent insight companies that are providing data on uh, the trials landscape globally. Uh, and uh, Fiona's going to talk us through the white paper that they're producing regularly on this topic. And then lastly, uh, Angela McFarlane, one of our foremost experts in the BIA community, of course, um, who will talk about um, some of the latest developments that iCube is involved in, of which there are many, and will give us a, a, a very authoritative perspective on the potential for future regulatory uh, and trials adjustments. So that's the format for today. Uh, I'm going to get straight into it because there's a lot to get through. So let's just move on and let's just look at the kind of the format. So news this week, that's you and me, Steve. Uh, then the order we're going to go through is Divya from NIHR, Fiona from Medidata, then Angela. Uh, but as ever, the, <clears throat> the focus of today's webinar is you, the audience, as well. So please do send in your questions. There's a question box on the GoToWebinar system. You start firing those over as soon as we start talking. I and Steve will look at those questions and throw them into the conversation as we go along. Uh, I'll do my best to keep track of what you're saying uh, and to give everyone a chance to throw comments uh, and points to our guest speakers as well. So do please use that function uh, as we go through. All right, good stuff. Uh, Steve, uh, it's been, as ever, uh, a whirlwind week. So let's just have a look at some of the latest developments. Uh, if I can just move my slides on. Yeah, no, I think it's a bit like that page in The Economist where they do the summary of the world's news in, uh, in a sentence or less. And I think that's what we're trying to do here in five very simple slides, what matters this week. So. So thank you. Um, vaccine trial uh, manufacturing deal, you may have seen overnight um, that AstraZeneca and University of Oxford have agreed a global development and distribution uh, deal for the university's um, COVID-19 uh, recombinant adenovirus vaccine. John Bell was on the radio this morning, Pascal Sorio was on the radio. I think this is great because it's going to strengthen the community that's already working through the BIA Vaccines Manufacturing Task Force uh, in support of that uh, Oxford candidate. Uh, and <clears throat> we saw earlier in the week uh, funding from the UK government to support the rapid scale up uh, of COVID-19 vaccine manufacture. So it feels like that's going uh, great guns. And we've also seen um, uh, a new platform for therapeutic trials. It's great to have Angela uh, on, the, on, on the webinar because uh, IQVIA have been involved in this and uh, NIHR to have a new clinical trial platform to rapidly test potential drugs for early stage trials, which also um, uh, feeds them into recovery. So we've got Accord and Recovery now as uh, platforms for clinical trials, which goes to the heart of perhaps some of the reforms that we're seeing, the pace at which we're seeing things change uh, in uh, in the COVID era, which may have implications for things uh, going forward, as we'll discuss later. So lots going on in vaccines, lots going on in clinical tri clinical trial platforms. Yeah, so that, that platform, Angela will talk about it and perhaps Divya in, in a bit later in the webinar, but that's focused on therapeutic treatments, isn't it? And we've seen just over the last couple of days, Steve, some positive signals coming out of uh, Gilead's therapeutic, haven't we? Yeah, so um, I mean, the reason I think this is important, again, another story that's broken overnight, largely from the States, is uh, is the first uh, uh, data readout of, uh, of a clinical trial for um, uh, a therapeutic that may have may have um, uh, a benefit. Uh, Gilead, obviously, BIA member company. Uh, some of this uh, trial was uh, it was coordinated and done with UK Science, so there's UK uh, uh, bases in in this, I believe. So um, uh, I, I think it's useful to see, and, and I suppose from 
the perspective of our sector, it shows the pace at which um, uh, clinical trial activity is happening within COVID-19. And it's great to, to see that there is some suggestion of, um, uh, of uh, advanced, accelerated recovery from advanced COVID-19 uh, from this. Obviously, lots more coming, but great to see something coming, coming through already. Yeah, absolutely. And testing's been the other big story of the week, hasn't it, Steve? Uh, and continues yeah. to be there. Yeah, so test, test, test remains uh, big news, and of course, as you as you say, today is the was the is the end of the month, and that's the deadline that uh, Matt Hancock set for, for 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 getting to a big number. But I think what's in, what's been interesting in the last week is we've seen um, the um, opening up of the tap for um, who can get access to testing uh, within the UK. Obviously, um, uh, BIA member companies have been involved as uh, as critical workers. But uh, now that's sort of spreading to everyone in England age 65 or over with symptoms can get tested along with symptomatic members of their household. So we've seen this evolve as the capacity has, uh, has evolved and we've seen the rollout of the army and various others to do this. Um, so that, that you are able, uh, if you are unable to work from home, you're eligible for testing. Research scientists can go to this, so be aware of that. And um, there's details on how that can be accessed on our BIA um, COVID.org uh, website. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I've listed on the website a couple of the, the two referral routes, both self referral and employer referral as well, which people need to be aware of. That, that clip in the middle, Steve, is, uh, is Matt Hancock's letter out to his database yesterday, which he specifically noted research sciences eligibility, which I think in some small part reflects uh, the, um, the calls we put into government over the last few weeks, doesn't it? You're right, yeah, and not, there we are. Construction workers, emergency plumbers, research scientists uh, exactly. uh, can now be tested. So, uh, illustrious, illustrious companions to be with. Exactly, okay, well I just thought, uh, just for somewhat a bit of a fun, it's not really a serious poll, but I thought maybe we could just kind of ask the audience, Steve, about this big 100,000 number today. Um, let's just have a go at this, I'll just launch it up quickly. Um, so uh, let's just go with that. People want to quickly vote. Will Matt Hancock meet his target of conducting 100,000 antigen tests by the end of April? It's a simple yes, no, or we probably will never find out kind of response. So uh, you want to have a vote yeah, on I that? Whilst people are voting, I think you know it's like we're unlikely to see a, a formal announcement from the government on this today. But I think what's what what I've remarked upon in the past few weeks is the immense amount of uh, of speed and innovation that we've seen in testing. I know many companies have been involved in the crowdsourcing platform that we've participated in with BIVDA, the Royal College of Pathology. I know many companies have been engaged in the national programs and I know that there's lots going on about innovation around uh, uh, home testing pilots, uh, thinking about population-based approaches, new ways with ELISA. So there's lots going on even if uh, the Wembley Fall single number approach is well, Wembley's only 80,000 now, is it? It shows you how old I am. I was 100,000 when I was <laughs> new the capacity of football stadiums. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I think uh, it's only one part of the of, of the jigsaw, this one. How, how are you doing on the, what's the results? There you go. So, 9% um, don't think it's possible to say. 12% say yes and 79% say no. We'll, we'll, we'll know by this time next week, won't we? Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, well, I mean, um, so, I mean, you know, testing is a big issue, notwithstanding that target, Steve, isn't it? So, I mean, as the capacity expands, the government's talked about the, the need for that expansion in order to start adjusting the lockdown policies. And there's this talk that the Prime Minister is going to come out with a sort of route out of lockdown at some stage of the next few days. Um, so, I mean, just worth flagging here, BIA's kind of role, role in this. I mean, it's the first point on the left there. Uh, we've been asked by Bayes to input into how the sector can respond and move to the next phase. Yeah, so I think you're right that the context is obviously now moving as we go through lockdown. Obviously, they're looking very closely at the impact on um, the transmission of the virus. I don't think we're there yet, but we're starting to think very hard. And I think the government's starting to think hard both about how um, safe working can happen in many sectors. And we've been asked to input for our sector. But I think because we're involved in testing, we also need to think through testing will move from, in a sense, supporting um, NHS or, or social care uh, um, staff into a broader part of our, our national life. And I think that we need to be thinking through that 
obviously some of that is is about employer employee potentially in our sector but if you think about it in other sectors uh, could be important so we need to watch where this is going um, it's interesting in the middle box here you, we look at um, the creation within the NHS of COVID free hubs or uh, cancer centres or places where they can be pretty confident that they can uh, continue to do vital work which is vital for our, for our sector for the continuation of um, much of the, 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 the research and, and continued work that, that our sector is involved in and they're thinking about about those um, but you can see that 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 may also provide a model for other ways of working small factories how are you going to get you know big bigger factories back up and running um, what's the testing regime in those those factories what could you do in smaller firms how do you get people to work all of those things and then schools and universities all the other challenges but you know testing is undoubtedly going to be at the heart of this as well as some other practices so interacting with those is going to be important and that's why really i suppose the the commitment this week that uh, the uk contact tracking app will be ready in two to three weeks we need to think about how technologies like that which are already being rolled out may or may not work or interact with some of the testing procedures and many of our companies work in that integration and we'll talk a little i think about this in terms of the the clinical trial infrastructure but um but uh, there's going to be a new way of working here so i think we're getting ready for this we should expect to see some further developments from the government and there may be some opportunities or interaction as public health and life science innovation takes center stage in uh, a post lockdown uh, environment in a way that i think will emerge in the next week 10 days and perhaps we'll have some more on this next time around yeah i think that's right isn't it uh, but, you know, uh, in terms of business operations, I mean, the government support package has evolved a little bit over the last week as well. So it's important that we just kind of acknowledge that. So we've had these new bounce back loans announced, haven't we? Um, so smaller loans for smaller businesses. Um, what do we make of those, Steve? Not, not so much detail come out on it yet. I think we're expecting this to go live on the 4th of May. Yeah, so um, what's interesting is we can see continued evolution of the support for, for, for businesses. If you missed the webinar last week, there was useful stuff on the knowledge economy package, um, of which, of course, the Future Fund uh, 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 coming alongside um, uh, convertible loans looks like it may well be uh, something that's of use for, 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 for some companies in our sector. And uh, look at that one in detail with Newman for last week. If you're interested, I think we're continuing to see that's a, a good one to follow. This new one, Bounce Back Loans, 100% guarantee uh, may be of use. It's uh, not a big number, but um, it, it's there and it has a low rate of interest, but we're still seeing some of the challenge um, challenges operationalizing that, undertaking in difficulty. If, if those of you who are familiar with that, that as, a, as, a, as a state aid test is, is likely to be a challenge and it'll be working through existing banks who, uh, as we know, have not been necessarily central for, for, for many of our companies. So uh, have a look at it. Uh, I think it's a, it's a development. I, I don't think it's likely to be a massive one for our sector, but be aware that it has happened. And of course, we're still waiting for more information on, on the uh, Innovate UK grant program that was announced as part of the innovation package and uh, further details on the convertible loans. But the, the, the webinar from last week has provides, I think, uh, a good insight into whether they're uh, there for you and we expect them to be uh, rolling out next month. So. Uh, that means tomorrow, doesn't it? I mean, within 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 the the early stages of of, of May. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for both of these, which I think are probably um, likely to be more important uh, than the one on the left. But uh, yeah. we haven't got much new on it today. That's right. Okay, Steve. I think that's it in terms of news. Um, so I'm just going to turn now uh, to the kind of the central question: impact on commercial research and clinical trials. Something we picked up on this morning, Steve, was this um, this story in the Times which is suggesting 2,700 research projects and trials for cancer, diabetes, and other diseases have been halted as a result of COVID-19, and thousands of research staff have been transferred to COVID programs and back to the front line. And, uh, you know, so clearly there is a big impact going on, and this is really something that I think, um, well, NIHR have been central to, so that's why it's great to have Divya Chattermanic on the call this morning. I mean, you can turn your... Uh, webcam on. Brilliant. Morning, Divya. Um, Morning, so sorry, all. So that, that, I mean, interesting setup in terms of that Times article this morning. And, and you know, we've spoken about this uh, ahead of time as well. So there is a big impact. NIHR in particular have done a lot of work to reprioritise what they are doing to support the COVID effort. Um, but let's just start with a quick introduction. So 
uh, your role is focused on uh, supporting and interfacing with commercial companies doing research, isn't it, at NIHR? Do you want to give us a bit more detail about what you do um, and, and what's going on? Okay, so um, morning everyone. Um, nice to e-meet you all, I guess. Uh, so my name is Divya Chadamanik. I am the Head of Commercial Business Development for the NIHR Clinical Research Network, a mouthful. Uh, but my role is to work with um, companies, pharma, biotech, medtech, CROs, a range of companies to support you doing clinical trials within the NHS within the UK. So that's my, my kind of role and my, my department's role. But you're absolutely right around the impact, I guess, Michael, of, of COVID-19. So NIHR, can you believe it's been more than a month almost from the lockdown? Um, but the NIHR, what we decided to do was pause um, any clinical research that was non-COVID related. And this is this was on the 26th of March, um, so more than a month now. We decided to put a pause on everything to really prioritize COVID-19 research. And this came... Uh, this initiative came directly from Sir Chris Whitty to us. Uh, he was our lead for NIHR as well. He is the chief scientific officer and leads on the NIHR and said, we must prioritize COVID-19 research. So um, it, we just made a massive turnaround to say, actually what we need is a UK wide approach, um, a system that will look at all research that needs to go on within the UK. And how do we, so how do we, kind of prioritize the studies. So um, we've now put together a single kind of collective system, which includes NIHR, includes Public Health England, includes the funding elements, so uh, UKRI as well, HRA, MHRA, and a whole host of other organizations to really ensure that we've got a, a complete picture of urgent public health research activity. And what we do now is we've asked companies, you could be a company or collaborating with a, a clinician, to submit studies, whether funded, whether you've got the funds to run the study yourself or unfunded, to submit studies into through our online system. And I'll, I'll talk about it. Maybe you can move to the next slide and I can take that. Sorry, Michael. That's all right. I'm just waiting for the system to catch up. There we go. OK, um, so I think you need to click through every slide for the things to come up. So um, so basically, the, the aim is that um, companies and organizations apply into the system to and provide us as much information about a study. So important to know, this is not about a product or technology, it's actually about clinical research. So must have some information about a study and apply online as a five minute online job. But I think what's most important is that um, the, the study then gets reviewed. So just to give you a flavor about the number of applicants we've had, we've had more than 700 studies applied through this process. So a huge volume of work uh, that's all out there. And this is this covers everything. So it's uh, data studies, sample collection, uh, novel therapeutics, uh, repurposed drugs, diagnostics, uh, covers a whole host of things. But those studies come through to us and they get, uh, there's a, a review done by a panel, it's called the Urgent Public Health Research Panel. And the panel um, looks at the scientific rationale for studies, looks at feasibility, deliverability, um, capacity to do that, competition with other studies, and then a review um, and then a recommendation is made to the chief medical officer and the deputy chief medical officer um, who then kind of say, yes, we think this is urgent public health research. Important to note um, is that there's a lot of studies that's important research. But what this panel is looking at is what is urgent. You know, we're in wartime. What can we do right now? Um, yeah. And when studies get, once a study is then approved through this process, it gets expedited status, an expedited status across the entire clinical research ecosystem from HRA approvals, MHRA approvals, uh, costing contract negotiation at site and recruitment. So a big push, a big focus to get these studies set up as quickly as possible and recruit to as quickly as possible so that we can get answers to the important questions, really. Yeah. And so many, this entire how, thing, sorry. How, how many have been through that process then? So if you flip to the next slide, um, I think I can tell you. So we've had uh, 32 studies that have been approved um, through this process. Yeah, out of the 700. So, uh, 
out of the 700, yes, 32. I mean, um, it's really important that these are the things that we, these are the studies we felt that um, was important to have the support in the current time. So again, the whole concept of important and urgent is really is really useful to hold. And these 32 studies um, include the, the large platform studies that you know you mentioned. So um, Angela will talk about the Accord. So I, I won't touch it. The Accord is one of the approved studies. We've got recovery that's been in the BBC News, which is in moderate patients, but remap cap, which is actually in um, severe patients as well, but also primary care study principle as well, another platform study. Um, so there's, it's, and it's a mix, a balance between studies that are academic, um, academic uh, funded, but also studies that are commercial contract funded as well. So we've got 32 studies that are currently on the list. And if you flip to the next slide, please, Michael. And that's the number of uh, patients that we've actually recruited to those um, not to all 32 because they're not all open at the moment but based on the 18 studies that are currently open to recruitment um yeah. 46,980 so this this these numbers it, it requires a huge amount of effort to recruit these numbers and that wouldn't have been possible without pausing some of the other studies um that we were focusing on and i'll touch a little bit later on about the impact of the pause. And this is just to kind of show that a day on day, the, the amount of recruitment that's going on across the country is absolutely massive. The number of sites across the country that have been involved in research. I mean, NIH always say 99.9% .9 of NHS trusts are taking part in research. At the moment, it is 100%. It is absolutely um, recruiting from ambulatory services, recruiting from the different services, also from the Nightingale hospitals that have been set up for COVID-19 patients as well. So if you flip yeah. to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I guess I, I'm in interest of time. I just wanted to give you a few, you know, we've got this process, but what does that actually mean for an organization? Just to give you a flavor for a couple of case studies, and I'm going to focus on the commercial um, contract study. So when I say commercial contract, I mean studies that a company funds itself really. Um, yeah. So this is a UK biotech firm, Sinogen, you would have seen it, it was in the BBC News. Um, so just to give you a flavour, in, in two weeks from when they, they wanted to kind of set up, um, they came through us to early, early March and within two weeks the study was open to recruitment, was opening and had recruited a first patient in with MHRA approvals, with HRA approvals through that timeline. So a big focus for us. And they've already recruited 66 participants already out of the 100. So the aim is to get as many people in as quick as possible to answer the research question. That's an important question. Yeah. If we move on to the next slide, please. So you spoke about this earlier on today, the Gilead studies, the Remdesivir studies. So we are supporting um, both of the studies. Uh, this particular example is the one for severe COVID-19 um, studies. I mean, this one is interesting because um, in, in 12 days, the study went from coming through to us to being open to recruitment. We've recruited 147 participants and within 16 days, we'd already recruited the, the allocated UK target. So we are now um, in, we are, we're recruiting for other countries that perhaps haven't reached their target yet. So we're really um, driving this through. Um, we've got 16 sites open up. And again, this um, we might talk about this later on, but it's just to show some of the we can do it in wartime and the lessons learned from all of these things that we're doing pretty quickly, um, which perhaps in in some um, other instances and again thank you um thank you michael is just to give you a flavor again same 12 days we recruited 54 participants this is the study in moderate COVID 19 and again the focus of every single part of the uk ecosystem working together um, to ensure that we we can um, recruit patients so if we flip to the last uh, case study really and this mm -hmm. one is um a, a roche study of toclizumab uh, again, we uh, quick set up a company was extremely happy with what we're doing in the UK. We recruited 43 participants already and we did that in 12 days for them. So 
pretty quick um, response in so much that UK is actually leading recruiting for this study compared to the rest of the world. So we're now increasing our sample size um, so that we can contribute to the uh, to the kind of global target to ensure that we're answering the questions as quick as possible. So these are some of the commercial studies that are on the portfolio, just to give you a flavor. And just before I close off, I guess I wanted to also share with you well, we can only do all these things. We only got, you know, there's only those many people in the system, especially since our priority within the NIHR are our workforce within the NHS, really, for research. Um, there has been a movement to move them towards frontline care, which has been an absolute priority. So um, pausing the ongoing studies. So we uh, a month ago, we reached out to our commercial sponsors um, of 1500 studies actually, which were in open or set up. And we, we asked them, you know, what are you doing? Are you continuing as planned? Are you partially pausing? Is it dependent on what the site is doing? Or have you taken a global kind of picture of what's happening? And um, actually the numbers up. So we've got a 96 response rate now, 96% of um, those studies have responded now. And it's 55% that have said to us that we're continuing as planned. So it's really it's really important because we need to we need to keep on top of this because at some point the 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 pause button that we put on the system will need to slowly be lifted to a what we call a resume activities and uh, the NIH is just in the throes of understanding um, how we might restart to take to to kind of mirror perhaps something that's happening within the NHS to really support research going forward to ensure it's not just a full stop. So how do we move that forward? And this is something that we are considering at, right at this very minute. So I think I'll I'll stop there. Hopefully I've given you an overview of, yeah, yes, we paused, but this is the other stuff that we've done by pausing it that we've been able to achieve for UK PLC. Fantastic. Got hold, question, got hold of the questions here, do you? Uh, you? Okay. You, you may not be able to answer some of these, so do, feel free to, to get me to kind of, you can pass if you want. But interesting question here from Dominic Bowers. Of the trials paused in the UK, so those are the ones uh, at the kind of the bottom of this chart. What therapy areas are they? Do you, are you in a position to share any more granular data on this? Uh, I do have it, but I don't know at the top of my head. But obviously, our portfolio. This is kind of reflective also of our portfolio, mm -hmm. which is mostly oncology. Um, yeah. But but yeah, sorry, yeah. don't have it in my head. Okay, no problem. Um, here's the big question, which I think all get, all three of our guests today will pick up on. What's the probability, this is Neil Bell, what's the probability of the accelerated approval process for the COVID studies to be adopted for non-COVID trials? That's no, the big absolutely. Question. It's the big question. And actually, we have got a task force, a little a team within NIHR that's looking at this, which is specifically around, well, We've done it in wartime and, and uh, the lessons learned from this. And there's not just the lessons learned in terms of quick setup and getting everything off the ground, but actually the implementary and delivering of these studies. How do we how did we get out and recruit so many patients? I mean, don't forget, there's also something about, um, you know, they're already there in hospital. They're not going anywhere. So recruitment is easy. But actually the regulatory system, the entire ecosystem being more pragmatic. And how can we take that pragmatism? back into the workplace and this is absolutely on top of our priority so we're not going to lose this um lose this and 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 as we as our ceo a uh, new ceo who actually started um, on the first of april uh, william vanterhoff who started on the first of april says you know we're in wartime but we must look at the lessons learned from this wartime when when we're back into business as usual so it's a big priority for us and we would absolutely yeah. take that on board Okay, good stuff. And the other big question is, I mean, Lisa Anson kind of puts it across here, you know, can you comment at all about when you think recruitment might start again for non-COVID studies, you know, that might not qualify for this urgent badging? So when might we see some sort of, you know, movement back towards kind of getting some of those studies back up and going? So we are, at the moment, we are working on a plan and by, um, we have to write back to the Department of Health with what that plan looks like and the plan is due to go back to the Department of Health on Tuesday next week for them to review. So just to give you the timelines, we've been asked to put a plan together by Tuesday next week, we will have a plan and then it goes back to Department of Health with regards to approval to um, say whether we go down that way or, or not. So it's it's in, in progress. Okay, well if people want to ask you that question and kind of pin you down a little bit further on it over the next few days you've very kindly put your email address on the bottom of this slide haven't you Vivian? um i mean it's been fantastic to hear the work of our on this 
uh, and as you say, it, it's going to keep moving. So uh, wouldn't it be fantastic to come back and have a chat in another few weeks' time, maybe, to see how things have shifted at that point? But look, thanks for the information. It's been incredibly insightful. But just in the interest of time, I'm going to move on now uh, to our next guest. But do please stay on the line, Divya, because there may well be some questions that come through that I can throw back at you. Um, yeah, sure. Okay, good stuff. So now I'm going to turn to uh, Fiona. Fiona Maney. Hi, Fiona. Hi. Hi, everybody. Yeah, good stuff. So brilliant that you can join us. So, um, so Fiona, you're from Medidata, um, a real kind of insight uh, organization that delivers a huge range of resources, reports, insights to many of our member companies, or could potentially do so, researchers, biotech companies internationally. And I think you know, the reason why um, it's fantastic to have you on here is that I've been reading with great interest these white papers you've been producing as an organization on COVID-19 as things have developed, which kind of give a sense of, at a global level, what has been this impact. So we've just heard there from Divya about what NIH are doing in the UK. I think you guys have got insights into what's happened globally on trials, haven't you? Absolutely. And, and maybe I can just give a little bit of insight into, into metadata, uh, which is actually now part of uh, DeSoe's system. Uh, as of last year. Um, metadata has, has been around for about 20 years and is really a company that is focused on digital transformation of life sciences and, and focused on providing clinical trials to accelerate drug development process. And our mission statement is here, it's about powering smarter treatments and healthier people. Um, and over that 20 year period, we've had um, about 20,000 studies that have been conducted on the metadata platform, where actually about 6,000 are happening right now. Uh, we have about a million registered users across 1,400 uh, customers and partners that actually access our, our platform. And we've had about 6 million, over 6 million patients that have participated in a clinical trial uh, on our platform. So, we also, from the fact that we've got so much data, we're able to uh, generate evidence and insights and trends to help pharmaceutical, biotech, medical device, diagnostic companies and academic uh, researchers, and really to accelerate value and minimize risk and op op uh, optimize outcomes. So in this situation, we felt it was really important to kind of be able to um, look at some of the trends that we can see in the data um, and actually produce a, a paper for industry. So as you see on the screen here, this is the third release which came out last week. So uh, for the last, uh, the last month or two and every two weeks, we provide an update on, um, on, on the data. So we have a lot of data and obviously through analytical capabilities and artificial intelligence, we're able to glean insights. Um, and this is what we've been doing with regards to COVID and the impact of clinical trials. Um, and this paper summarizes, um, I guess, some of the insights uh, from our data, but also the regulatory perspective and also some of the solutions that could be leveraged immediately uh, to support um, COVID-19 trials um, and other trials that are ongoing. So uh, if you can go to the next slide, please, Michael. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of um, some well, a couple of areas of the analysis we've been doing. Um, in terms of patient enrollment, and this is looking globally, so, and it's great to see the phenomenal work that Divya and, and um, the, the, her organization are doing, but here we're looking at this from a kind of global perspective. Um, and here, um, and this is obviously within the paper, you can see a view of metadata's analysis of the change in new patients entering clinical trials uh, for actively recruiting studies. And it demonstrates the growing significance of the pandemic's impact on, on cities, regions, countries, um, and increasing tighter laws and guidelines restricting the movement by anyone outside the home. So the global data shows um, that a seven, there's a 75% decrease in the average number of new patients entering uh, uh, per study site year on year for the last two weeks of April compared to the same time frame last year. And obviously there's, there's more detail around these numbers within the paper. And this compares also to a decrease we saw in the month of March and the data indicates that an impact of the pandemic on patient enrollments in most countries obviously continues to grow clearly. Um, and actually only China, South Korea and Italy saw a decrease uh, in impact with the last version of the report, uh, we re released an additional metric tracking visits per study in ongoing studies. So uh, visits, uh, if that's the next slide, please, Michael. Yeah, sure. Um, so so, China seems to be kind of 
getting back sort of to normal a little bit. I mean, that's quite a big reduction. Uh, and I think this is, yeah, I think this is a really positive um, view because obviously we saw a decrease, um, uh, but now we're we're seeing things come back again. So I think for China and Korea, definitely we're seeing seeing a positive move um, in enrolment again, um, which I think is positive for the industry to know. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll we'll follow suit um, uh, as we go forward through this pandemic. Yeah, so uh, China's that pink line at the top ticking up quite nicely there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is also showing that within the US specifically, there's a 17% decrease in visits per subject between the period of October 2019 and March 2020. And China had seen a steeper decline with a period of with a percentage of 30 a 30 percent decrease from the same period, so October actually October to February. Uh, but now China is seeing a 22 percent improvement in visits per subject between February and March. So again, uh, like I say, we're seeing that that positive um, maneuver here globally. And it's clearly logical uh, that countries that have been hard, hit hardest by the pandemic would see the biggest impact and. Uh, actually, US and UK have been particularly alarming. Um, we will obviously continue to publish uh, these trends on uh, on a, uh, I think it's twice monthly basis, um, and provide an understanding of what's happen happening on the ground, and which is really critical to define the path forward. Um, so. If you think about it now, I'm going to kind of obviously we have the white paper there and it's available for, for all to view. It's on our website. Um, but the other thing that we do, obviously, is we we have a department that tracks um, any regulatory change that impacts uh, clinical trials. So for internally, but also externally. So and that's no different <laughs> clearly to COVID-19. Um, we've been tracking all of the, uh, the updates that the regulators have been coming out with and, and we summarize that. I mean, if you think about it as well, I mean, it's it's absolutely astonishing that essentially we've, um, you know, it was only last month uh, that the World Health Organization declared a pandemic. And, and obviously, um, as a result, we have all of these new updates regionally uh, and nationally as well from the regulators. Um, so that, um, uh, that summary of those um, regulatory um, uh, guidances are out also on our on our uh, website as well. So in terms of um, the common themes um, uh, that the regulators are kind of discussing, it's clearly patient safety uh, is the primary concern here. So, um, and also in this situation, the safety of uh, site staff and others working operationally on, on clinical trials is clearly paramount. Um, and maintaining compliance with good clinical practice still and minimizing risks to trial integrity. Um, risk assessment and the expectations around that, deciding whether to be able to continue and halt the trial. Obviously, we just heard from, from Divya that, that perspective uh, on um, you know, halting trials or postponing them and, uh, and prioritizing COVID trials. And then if there are trials continuing, then what you need to do in terms of amendments and deviations. And then the ability to um, have now remote visits. Um, so remote visits versus site visits. Obviously, we're we're self-isolating or uh, so you know uh, distancing ourselves, so it's not possible to go to site. And now, you know, some some trials will be able to to do things more remotely. Um, there is also a positive move to centralised and remote monitoring activities, um, and also very varied. Um, um, I guess guidance is around informed consent. So the FDA um, do allow electronic informed consent. The EMA allow for consent to be done orally in this situation with an uh, impartial witness. Um, and uh, you know, there's various other um, views as well uh, from some of the other regulators as well, allowing email uh, confirmation and, and follow up. And then obviously getting the supply of um, drug product to uh, to the patient and um, uh, there is an endorsement obviously to the direct to, to patient um, um, direct to patient uh, drug supply uh, being a possibility as well, which actually in, in some cases is already is already established. Um, yeah. So in, in general, though, I think. Um, uh, although there's great alignment and collaboration between the regulators and they've been pragmatic, they've been flexible, um, but there are nuances between 
uh, the different authorities. Um, so they need to be taken um, independent, viewed independently. Um, the other thing that we, or the other initiative we've got going on is um, uh, with regards to COVID-19, obviously you need to do a risk assessment of, of clinical trials and there is technology already there uh, around uh, risk-based quality monitoring and um, we've pulled together a template that is readily um, uh, usable um, and available on the website of all the different criteria that need to be thought about with regard to COVID-19. So I've added the link there to that as well, also to that white paper, um, if um, anybody's interested. So that also talks around patient safety, data integrity, data collection and monitoring and oversight. Yeah, absolutely. Well, fantastic set of resources there, Fiona. I mean, quite a few questions coming here, looking for more information on that data. I think rather than go through individually, we're a bit of short of time today, I would say go and check out what Medidata have actually published on this and follow up separately with Fiona. I mean, the key thing here is that, you know, it is a fast moving situation. It's fantastic to hear you're updating this data on a kind of a two weekly basis. Um, uh, and I imagine, as is always the case with things like this, there's a huge amount of data that sits behind these publications as well, which um, yeah. people can get access to do if, if they if they choose to kind of link up with you more directly. Um, so um, yeah, brilliant. Thanks for going through all of that. It, it's really interesting to see kind of the global data um, from such an authoritative perspective. Now I'm just going to turn now. So are you going to be able to stay on the line as well, Fiona? Just in case I need to pick up any of these questions. Sure, no Good problem. Stuff. All right, well, I'm going to turn now to Angela McFarlane from IQVIA, uh, another source of incredible insight into our industry on virtually any topic that you might choose to mention, uh, but certainly in relation to co So I suppose, Angela, morning. I mean, th th there are two morning. things here. There's, there's IQVIA as a source of insight, a bit like we've seen from Medi Medidata, but of course, IQVIA are also directly involved in some of these programmes that Steve mentioned earlier, aren't they? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I'd like to share in the time that we have left um, insights into the Accord study um, and how the systems and processes that were put in place uh, to uh, enable that to happen uh, absolutely reflect everything that Divya has been saying. And I'd like to start, if I may, um, as ever, being a little bit controversial, um, by posing both a, a question and a challenge. So could the adversity that COVID-19 uh, has, has, has caused the world and the UK um, actually be a catalyst for UK clinical research transformation? And when we look at what has happened over the last six weeks to get recovery, to get Accord and the other studies that Divya mentioned, we can see this coming together and removal of the old bureaucracy to really uh, transform uh, the way in which we can do things at pace and scale. And Divya used the words in wartime. Um, I don't know what the new peacetime is going to look like. I think talk about getting through COVID-19, not uh, not ending COVID-19. Um, but our, but our challenge is, uh, and that's a challenge to the UK clinical research community, the CROs, but in particular to the UK government and regulatory authorities. How do we take that learning forward, and how do we establish a new norm for research? We just move it's on. Uh, sorry, go, Michael. Funny. I just say I just want to pick up that Matt Cooper's just stuck in mean, basically the same challenge in our questions box here. He refers to the new normal. Um, you know, can this be a USP for the UK when the old problem uh, of leaving Europe comes back into focus? So I know you're going to pick up on this at a later point in your slides. So let's just get into it. Um, I'd, I'd so go so far as to say that if we don't, uh, we should be ashamed of ourselves. Uh, as, as, uh, as, 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 a, as a country. So um, I just wanted to start very quickly and, and I won't dwell too much on this because obviously Fiona's uh, picked up a lot of this, but we know that COVID-19 is clearly impacting the ongoing and planned clinical uh, trials for both the top ranked and the smaller pharmaceutical companies. So on the left hand side, you can see uh, the top 20 pharma companies uh, and this is global research, uh, sorry, EU research done by our uh, European thought leadership team. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you can see the numbers of uh, the impact um, by smaller companies. And, and this is using our uh, Midas, Midas data. I'm going to move on now, if I may. Yeah, sure. What about life before COVID? Um, so what I want to do here is just reflect on the UK challenges um, that we have been facing for years now. Um, but I think really became honed um, following the Brexit referendum. Uh, the challenges that we face um, as a UK research environment in a very globally competitive uh, market. So in terms of global commercial clinical trial activity, the UK represents just three, three to four percent. And of course, the European bloc uh, represents 18 to 22 percent 
uh, of all commercial clinical trial activity. But the giant, as you'd expect, is the USA. But I want to bring your attention to the, some, you know, some fairly harsh facts, and this is probably as negative as I will be today, but our UK <laughs> study starts up time. Um, and that is one of the key determinants of what attracts companies to place a clinical trial in the UK. Our, our activation is 42% slower than the US, which is held up very much as the gold standard. Um, and that goes some way to explaining why they have 40 to 45% of all commercial clinical trial activity. Our ethics approval, and again, think about what we've achieved in the last six weeks, is currently five times slower than the States, two times slower than Ukraine, and twice as slow as Poland. Um, not really a position that you know we could feel particularly proud about. So um, for the last two years, uh, IQVIA um, have been uh, talking to UK government departments. And back in September, we presented um, our, our recommendations at a round table held at number 10. And I'd just like to call out some of the recommendations that we made and how they are now actually being enacted through um, NIHR, through MHRA, through HRA. Um, that will really take us forward if, if, if the government chooses to listen after uh, the COVID uh, crisis. So they fall into three buckets uh, to make the UK globally attractive. Accelerate UK startup times, enhance our UK delivery capability, and Divya made a really good point, it's not just about startup, it's about getting the job done, and then study enablement. There's a lot on this slide, I'd like to just call out uh, point two, uh, point three, uh, and point five. So a single national commercial UK ethics committee. At the moment, we have to go through lots of different ethics committees. They take holidays. Um, we get delays in that way. And we've shown through this process over the last six weeks that having one single uh, ethics committee can really drive things forward and really mo mo mobilise. We need effective centralised contracting. If we'd had um, over the last few weeks to have to go around to every site and get involved with the contract negotiations, each of those sites, we wouldn't be up and starting and putting our first patients uh, into accord uh, this week as we are. We need a national research policy for de-identified patient data, absolutely crucial in terms of increasing the opportunities for UK patients to engage in research. And we're actually proposing an opt-out standard, such as the English deemed consent uh, for, for organ transplants. You know, that's, it, that's not a radical thing to do, uh, and we ought to be able to do it. So those are the asks that we're making, and some of those, um, some of those, fact, some of those features are already uh, what has enabled uh, Accord uh, to actually happen. So um, let's move, if we may, uh, into the Accord programme. Uh, it stands for Accelerate, Accelerating COVID-19 Research and Development. It's a completely unique collaboration, and it's aimed at hyper-accelerating hyper uh, research so that we can discover COVID-19 treatments in months, not the average 18 months uh, that it takes uh, in, in normal peacetime situations. And in fact, we're talking and our ambition is within three, within three weeks. So uh, you can see uh, the partners there, uh, the NIHR, our, our, our main partner, um, uh, the key sponsor is Professor uh, Tom Wilkinson down in Southampton. Um, IQVIA obviously and AZ. And its overall objective is to look at the effectiveness of repurposed medicines, potential new drugs, and as yet unlicensed therapies. Um, IQVIA is providing the single research platform. Sorry, Michael, could you go back? Uh, IQVIA is providing the, the single uh, research platform across the UK to facilitate multiple adaptive clinical trials. And this is, I think, the most exciting feature of this. And this is what is going to allow this to go at pace and scale and why the government really brought it brought into this uh, as a way of going. Uh, the point there about the accelerated approval uh, process, without compromising in any way, shape or form, the safety and efficacy protocols of the NHR, I, NIHR is going to de deliver those results in weeks rather than 18 months. You can see there that Bergen Bio, Bio and their AXL inhibitor, Bemcetinib, is the first candidate in accord. And in fact, uh, patients will be going on to Bencetinib just this week. So it is really exciting if we can move on. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I've stated the overall objectives actually in the previous slide. So I think that we can, we can probably uh, go, but there's one point I do want to call out is that as soon as we have the results from Accord, um, those uh, compounds will move very rapidly uh, into large scale trials, such as the recovery program, um, which uh, Divya has already alluded to. 
Uh, the single yeah. national platform that we have is a propriety technology solution. It allows us to use our technology, and uh, Fiona alluded to this earlier on, to minimise the infection risk and the administrative burden uh, on NHS hospitals and, of course, on our investigators as well. Um, and this uh, particular study platform is going to enable thousands of patients uh, to get access. We're talking um, about up to 24 um, uh, compounds being fed into the Accord programme by uh, the Government Scientific Steering Committee, um, which falls out of the Therapeutics Task Force. So this is so, so exciting, so lean, um, and yeah, great learning to be had from it. So we can just move on. Um, you can see there the quotes. Those quotes are out there on our, our, our press study, but particularly uh, the quote, um, you know, we're obviously very proud, so Tim's quote there, but Jonathan Sheffield talking about the Accord transforming the way in which the research community finds treatments for global challenges such as COVID. And it's that transformation uh, that we really want to see uh, go forward. Um, this this programme wouldn't ha have happened without the leadership and vision of Professor Tom Wilkinson um, and, uh, you know, real credit to be given uh, for, for how um, Tom has, has, has driven this forward uh, in, a, in a very resolute manner. And if I can just move on. So um, my final slide is, is the questions. Will COVID-19 be a catalyst for UK clinical research transformation? Can we take the learning and the actions to transform it? So we've had exemplar leadership and collaboration. There have been no boundaries, there have been no barriers. Bureaucracy has been steamrolled down. And that has gone on between the NIHR, the MHRA, government, HRA, um, UKRI, uh, who are a leading player uh, partner in this, and funding's coming through UKRI and industry. Um, and, and the question is, are, will the collaborators be able to take that learning forward and create a new UK research norm to help galvanise COVID-19 clinical research recovery and reinvigoration, which will take the UK to become an exemplar research environment? Um, I don't think any other country in the world uh, is going to be showing the kind of discoveries that we make, uh, both on the vaccines and the treatments for COVID-19. And surely that's going to position us as the place to come uh, for your, your precision medicine clinical trials uh, going forward. So with that, Michael, um, I'll, I'll finish. Okay, brilliant. Well, there's a question immediately, and I'm going to throw straight back at you, Angela. Um, <laughs> is it, Matt Cooper again, is it time to call for a professional ethics service and triage according to uh, commercial academic student research? So professional ethics service? Any idea what Matt's angling for there? Uh, no, Matt, I think you need to, do you mind just expanding a little bit? Okay, <laughs> I'm going to go to that one. Uh, um, any of our speakers can pick these up as I throw them in. Do please flip back on your, your webcam. With current the current COVID situation, do we know whether regulatory bodies, maybe this is one for you, Fiona, do we know whether regulatory bodies will be amending requirements in order to make direct-to-patient shipments of investigational or medicinal products easier? So getting shipments into patients, is that going to change? Or is that something you've seen in terms of regulatory easements? Yeah, so obviously that's a point that they, they do talk about in, in, the, um, in the guidances at a high level. So I think, um, I mean, and to, to the point as well, you know, do we think we're going to see change across the clinical trial landscape in the way we do things? I think some of the regulators have been very uh, clear on the, the fact that it's actually only going to be for the, the kind of COVID pandemic period, um, which I actually think there's a whole debate to be had there. So yes, I think there is a possibility um, for increased flexibility and uh, different ways of doing things. And I think there's a, and that includes obviously direct to patient supplies, et cetera. And I think across the board, you know, we're, we're kind of, I think COVID has created a, a kind of sense of urgency and a sense of accelerated ability for drug development and research. And I think that, you know, there's an opportunity for us to actually go beyond beyond COVID and actually where we're able to accelerate things and, and have things working remotely. I think um, it would be nice to see uh, that this continuing on in, into the future. But at the moment, I think the regulators have been quite clear in saying, this is just for the COVID period only. Um, and I guess that's my, my perspective. I think across the board, we, we will see change during this period, and I hope that goes beyond this pandemic period. 
Okay, good. Steve, I'm going to come to you. I mean, this is the big question. What's your, I mean, you can see the questions there in the box. I mean, people are focusing on this. I mean, I'll pick out Neil Bell's comment. What's the probability of the accelerated approval process for COVID to be adopted for non-COVID trials? You know, what's your take on this, and both in terms of what people have said today and your view, your view of the future? The world has already changed, is my view, and Angela's laid out how it's already changed. Um, I don't think we'll be going back. I, I think that there will probably need to be some some work in the detail. I mean, one of the things that the UK has got, and the, those of us who've worked in the system for a while, is there is a network capability here. Uh, we have all been talking to each other for a number of years, and some of the things, the, some of the pressure points in the dam have now gone. Um, and we are able to show, or we will, we need to be able to show in this period of time why working in this way is better. I think it presents challenges to some businesses, it presents opportunities to other businesses, but I think that this is what we as trade association can do is show in real time the real developments that are happening. The purpose of these is innovations for, for, for patients. And, I, and I, I'm uh, really confident and go to Angela's point that globally we need to go and shout from the rooftops the unique capability the UK has got in terms of delivering really high quality data that's trusted based in fantastic science. But actually we can link together with a with a with a healthcare system which is in a unique position to provide a whole series of sets of data. Uh, and this is the, the proving ground. Either we'll do it in this time and therefore we'll have a, a, a fundamental future or we won't and that will be very difficult. But I'm confident that we can. I know everybody's up for it and I think it's really, I mean, you know, COVID is terrible, but in, in research terms, there's some really exciting innovation happening here. And we all need to be um, be, be able to, to sell that as we look globally uh, and, uh, and, and think about what the UK's position in the, in the ecosystem is uh, going forward. Yeah, okay, good stuff. Look, there's this question about speed, right, Angela, but there's also a question about capacity, which Dominic Bowers is raising here. So he's saying, what about the latent capacity in the UK system to get that share above the three or 4% we already have? Um, we can maybe speed things up, but is it also a question of capacity? Maybe that's a question for you as well, Divya. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think Divya would uh, would be the best to answer on the capacity uh, in her role, for sure. Yeah, and, and you know, there, there's something, so as part of the life sciences industrial strategy um, that was set out, the, uh, one of the sec one of the outputs of the sector deals is around the creation of capacity within the NHS, specifically uh, around late phase delivery of trials. So the patient recruitment centers was one of the initiatives that are over there. Uh, and just to give you, I guess, an update on that. So this was the gov uh, this was essentially stake ensuring that we can create capacity. So there is a, a 7 million, um, that is going to five NHS organizations. And I can say that the five NHS organizations have been selected. I can't name them yet. We're still in contracting processes. Um, but essentially uh, these five centers will have dedicated research staff, dedicated centers, provide a, a concierge-like service for commercial contract research only. So it's to mirror kind of the early phase infrastructure that we've got for late phase to really focus on that capacity problem that a lot of people say, yes, we've got the NHS, yes, we've got the NIHR infrastructure to support that. But actually mm. what we need is research capability and capacity to really accel accelerate recruitment. How can we do more? I mean, it's interesting that we've managed to get such large volumes of recruitment, but actually with a much reduced workforce, we've lost some workforce to COVID-19. Um, we had um, our first research nurse who actually passed away with COVID-19 yesterday. So we're losing our workforce to the front line. We're losing our workforce to COVID, but we have absolutely managed to maintain that. And I think it's absolutely important that we take the lessons and we're, we're not losing sight of that. I guess it's just to provide assurance that we're not losing sight of that. And you're quite right, Angela, you know, we we have got an opportunity here to, to showcase what we're doing in the UK, but take that into the next phase as we move along in whatever peacetime means. And the NIHR's unique CRN network, um, there isn't anything like it anywhere else okay. in the world. And when you read the, the NIHR's annual reports, uh, and you see how much they've grown in the last three years. So there's been no downturn, um, either in the number of trials, but also in their capacity to deliver, um, adding in the uh, features that uh, Divya has just referred to. Um, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the UK can, can more than cope with the capacity, um, more than. Yeah. Thank okay, you, Angela, you. I did my job. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, Steve, we're at, we're at the top of the hour, uh, so we've uh, we've had our allotted time. I think 
whilst I'm, there's a massive debate to be had on this, but I think in the interest of our audience, I think maybe we'll draw a line under it there. Um, I, I just want to kind of conclude by saying fantastic conversation. Thanks so much, Divya, Angela, Fiona. Um, really great contributions. Quite a few people saying, can I have copies of slides and get further access to data? But from in terms of, of what you've all presented, um, certainly stick a, a note in the feedback survey, uh, which will be sent out to you after we close the webinar. Uh, and we'll try and get those to you. Or uh, I guess um, people can get in touch with our guest speakers directly as well, uh, where their contact details have been provided. Um, so uh, Steve, uh, any final words from you before I close things off? <clears throat> I just think it's really exciting. Thank you all for sharing everything in real time. Okay, yeah, well, thanks from me too as well. I hope you've all, uh, apologies for how short it was, but um, some really great data, some great insights and some great discussions. So thank you all very much. And thanks to our audience for listening. See you all again next week, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.